Hi, Jack. Shake hands. No. High five. Easy. Easy. Good miss. <laughs> hey. Hey, I'm here. What little thing can I do for you? Hey, Arb is like walking into the fellowship hall right now. Um, okay. Ask Barb if she found the touch cards to lay out. Okay. And then I, I want to know if I didn't call Brandon. Um, are there touch cards for Evelyn Bent? Are there like in the bulletin? Is there anything written in the bulletin today? About who? About um, touch cards. Oh, just not, not about Evelyn. Right. Okay. And then if, she, if, and then Carol Quinn, they were touch cards for 
for um, Susie Ewell. There's some place in there. So I see Susie's in the audience in the church. So if somebody could give those cards to Susie. Okay, just a minute. Got all that? Can I know? <laughs> Did I ask you to read? Oh, you can read it with her? Yeah. Ah, hey. hey, Barb. I see you. Excuse the majority of their speech, whatever. Oh, good. But now, what else? Oh, <laughs> did um, did are the cards for Susie you were laying around someplace? Because those for went. Susie you were laying around. I she has no idea. Carol um, Newman or Carol Quinn might know. Carol Quinn might know, but I don't know who Carol Quinn is. Oh. Tell about it. I'm just going to go ask somebody. Or Nick, Nikki's walking out right now. Oh, I see Barb walking back to the crying room. Because they, because the touch cards were for Bart, for, were for Susie for Bill Yule last week, but I forgot to have somebody give them to Susie, so I, so I talked to her and she did not get them, so I'm trying to see where those are at. Okay, I should have you talk to Bart because I don't know any of these people. <laughs> oh, go on to the cry. You know what the crying for Bart walked to. It's in the front of the it's in the front of the sanctuary. Oh, here she comes. Here comes Barb. Okay. Thanks, watching. I'm talking to Lucia while she's in church. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm so I'm so sorry. I needed. I, you should talk to somebody who knows. Oh, and hand the phone over to, to Carol. Carol Quinn. To Carol? Carol Quinn. Yeah. Yeah. Chef, but she has a question. She has a lot of questions that I can't answer again. How are you? Hey, good. Well, I was up to the church today, but then I had a problem, so I wasn't able to. So it's it. I I had I ended up having a blister on my hand. My hand swelled up. So um, and then I had some bathroom problems. So that doesn't go any further. But <laughs> anyways, oops, I gotta get off. Wait, I gotta get off. I gotta mute myself. Okay.
Good morning, this beautiful summer day. There are some announcements uh, briefly. Um, this Tuesday at 1.30 is the uh, memorial service for Dallas Jones. Um, also Tuesday morning, the uh, packing for the South Wedge food program and um, Saturday is the delivery of that food. And we have two birthdays this week, Nancy Barkland, Malloy, and the, a week from today, Jacqueline Fitas. Are there any other announcements that people would like to um, give? Okay, shall we join in the, oh, the prelude, A Mighty Fortress.
Thank you, Ellen. The music in church is one of my favorite parts of church. Would you please stand and join me in the call to worship adapted from Psalm number 18. I love you, Lord, my strength. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge. I call to the Lord who is worthy of my praise. I will sing the praises of your name. Let us join together in the opening prayer. Thank you, Lord, that you are with us this morning as you've promised to be. We welcome you amongst us as we celebrate the gifts of your grace and peace that you lavish upon us. We ask that you open our ears so that we may hear your voice. Open our minds so that we may receive your eternal wisdom. Open our spirits so that we may know your leading and guidance. And open our hearts so that we may receive your wonderful love. We ask this in the name of his great and all names, Jesus Christ. Amen. Shall we join in hymn number 379, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less.
Shall we join together in the prayer of confession? Eternal God, in whom we live and move and have our being, your face is hidden from us by our sins, and we forget your mercy in the blindness of our hearts. Cleanse us from all our offenses and deliver us from proud thoughts and vain desires. With lowliness and meekness, may we draw near to you, confessing our faults, confiding in your grace, and finding in you our refuge and strength through Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. The assurance of pardon from St. Paul, who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. The scripture list lesson today is from Genesis 2, verses 8 through 9, 15 through 17, and chapter 3, verses 1 through 12, all about Adam and Eve. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put a man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man and he brought her to the man. And the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. Adam and Eve were both naked, and they felt no shame. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. But God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not die, certainly, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized 
they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Let's join in the hymn, Open My Eyes That I May See, number 324. I come join you down here okay scripture the second scripture lesson from james well hang on to your hat you've probably read it before and then we'll just see what god has for us in here what causes fights and quarrels among you oh i, I didn't mean to ask you that question but that's what james asked what causes fights and quarrels among you don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want. So you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. I looked up. And I lost it. There it is. That's what may spend. That's that you may spend what you get on your prodigious pleasures. I shouldn't look at you and read too, huh? You are adulterous people. Don't you know the friendship with the world means the enmity against God? 
Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? Put, but he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says, God opposes the poor, but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but setting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbors? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we sense you with us as we sing the songs, as we see your love among the faces. We just pray that you'll help us as we settle into your word that we'll hear, we'll see, and we'll be illuminated to be more of the people that you would have us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Barb and I took what we considered to be one of the lifetime trips for us to celebrate our 25th wedding anniversary. We planned it in the 25th year, but went on the 26th year. And actually it was five years ago, right about now, we were floating up the Rhine River on a Viking cruise and they treated us like kings and queens. And that staff was just one of them. The views were just stunning, especially all the vineyards on all the hills going all along the river. The same case, in some cases, there were hills that were in such an incline that I had no idea how they were able to maintain that pristine condition. For years, I have heard about the wine of Europe and was considered the best in the world. But we learned on that trip that America has played an especially important part in that success. In the 19th century, there was a blight that was caused by an aphid. There was many diseases that had come and had damaged the vines, but there was nothing like this aphid that caused the worst. This was known as the Pelusia, and it was attacked the roots of the vine. Many attempts were made to save the vineyards with little success until someone discovered that the roots in America were resistant to the aphid. This allowed the farming communities to graft their prize winning vines to the roots of the plants from America. For the last 200 years, this procedure has been followed. Before the new plant is put into the ground, even today, there must be a marriage between the plant of Europe and the root from America. I was in awe as I gazed at the vines and realized all the work that had gone into the making of them to be so beautiful. But the real answer yet was not even visible. It was hidden in the soil, doing its work, protecting the vine. The answer was a resistant vine root. Two weeks ago, Bob Kaiser was with us and he told us to get our roots deep into the soil so that the visible tree above would be strong. Today, I would like you to think about the health of our roots, even if they are deep, deep into the soil. We need to have roots that are resistant to the evil. Friends, 
These evils are in the places that are not visible to others. It's impossible to see the aphids of your soul, but it is the thing that causes us to have relationship problems. It is what causes us to not have peace in our homes, our churches, our communities, state, nation, and world. Both of our scriptures this morning deal with coveting, the sin that seems no one wants to talk about. But James, the brother of Christ, was clear as a bell on this. He asked the believer what caused them to have fights and quarrels among them. He answered his own question by saying, you covet because you cannot get what you want. I heard about a church where there seemed to be apathy among the members. The minister was concerned that they would not get a quorum out for to conduct the business of the church. So on the Sunday before the church meeting was going to be held, he announced to all the members that they certainly should be in attendance because there was going to be a fight. He thinks he apparently had the answer to get people motivated, especially the peace-loving Christians in that church. I'm sure that a pastor has never had to take that extreme action here at OPC. Now, in our walk with God, the word covet is not new. We have first heard of it when we learned about the Ten Commandments. I'm sure you can quote them with me. What's the first one? Yeah, I started anything. I was lucky to get God before me. You shall not make idols is the second one. The third, I shall not take the name of the Lord God in vain. Fourth, remember to keep the Sabbath day holy. Five, honor your father and mother. Then it goes, do not, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false suits against your neighbor, and you shall not covet. These are the Ten Commandments that God gave to Moses when he was in the wilderness and shared with the Israelites. God was preparing them for the day when they would go into the promised land. Now, that Tenth Commandment, even though it is the last one, is not the least. The first four deal with your relationship with God, and the last deal with your relationship with everybody else. Only four for God, but six for us. It is my belief that if you take that 10th commandment and follow it to the fullest, you make, you make, it, makes it will become possible for you to follow the other five above it fully and completely. If you do not covet then, you will respect your parents. You will not murder. You will not commit adultery. You will not steal. You will not bear false witness. Let's be clear that this commandment does not deal only with the relationships in the church as James dealt with it in his letter. It is the core about how we relate with members of our families, our employment, our friends, and our neighbors. What is the meaning of covet? Coveting is wishing for, longing for, yearning for, craving for something that belongs to or is similar to what someone else has. This causes us to become envious and jealous. These are feelings which come from our very core of our being. They are the feelings of discontent. They raise their ugly head with our self-esteem is threatened. These feelings come when we perceive that we might lose something or someone that we hold. Yeah, that's all I forgot. They come I when we also perceive that someone else is enjoying a better life and a better circumstance while we are enjoying our own. We are not content in the life that God has created for us. Let's look at the scripture that Carol read for us from Genesis about the first humans on this glorious earth. You know the story well. God created this wonderful place in the east, as the scripture tells it, called the Garden of Eden. In this garden, we see many trees that grow out of this lush soil. They were pleasing to look at, and they were also good to eat. I'm prejudiced, but I cannot think that they were better than the trees in the Adirondacks. 
Barb and I stare upon, can stare upon those ADK trees for hours at a time while we're in vacationing on Seventh Lake in the fall. Some people just do not have an appreciation for it. My brother Ralph, during the summer, used to pump gas at the local mobile station in Long Lake. And one day he was filling a car and as he was talking to the occupants and asking them about their trip, they complained about how boring it was and there was nothing to look at. They said all there war was from all the way from Utica up was trees. Now in the Garden of Eden, the trees were not only good to look at, but they were also good for food. But on the other hand, the trees in the Adirondacks may have been used for food, but certainly not as healthy as those in the, the Garden of Eden. The word Adirondack comes from a word that the Mohawk tribe used to degradingly describe the Algonquin tribe, Hadaranda. Bark eaters is the word for eaters of trees. There are two special trees in the place in the middle of the garden. One was a tree of life and the other was a tree of knowledge of good and evil. God took Adam to the garden and instructed him to work the garden and to take care of it. God gave Adam instruction that he could eat from any tree in the garden except the one of knowledge of good and evil. If you do, you will certainly die. It appears that God sensed that Abe, Adam was lonely among all the beauty and the food he could have forever. God said, it's not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. God brought out all the animals before Adam to find him a helper. And while they were doing that, they were doing two jobs at once. Adam named all the animals as he was looking for their worthiness, but none was found. So God took a rib from Adam and used it to create Eve, who would not only be his helper, but also would be his companion, his soulmate. This reminds me of the experience of a young boy who had been to Sunday school and church like they regularly, his parents and family regularly did on a Sunday. This one Sunday, the lesson in the Sunday school was about the creation of Adam and Eve and how she was created. When he arrived home that Sunday, he went immediately and rested on the couch. When his mother was settled in to the house, she went to him and asked, what was the matter? He responded by saying that he was going to get a wife. The mother responded, that certainly isn't possible at this age to have a wife. She says, honey, what in the world would make you come up with such a crazy idea? After a sigh, he says, my ribs hurt. Now back in the garden was a serpent, crafted in all the other animals. I was talking to Eve on the day, he was talking to Eve one day and the serpent asked Eve, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Such a tricky one, isn't he? Setting Eve up, to get her to a position to come back and plant another thought in her mind. It appears that it is not the first conversation that they've had because of the way the question was phrased. Did God really say? Or maybe the serpent overheard a part of a conversation between Adam and Eve when Adam was explaining to Eve all that God had instructed him before Eve came along. Doubt is one of the strongest tools of the tempter and our thinking process as we respond to others in our life. It's the wedge that begins to open the crevices of our mind and heart to allow thoughts and feelings to take hold that are not productive. We begin to have doubt about God, about our family members, about our friends. We even begin to doubt ourselves. Doubt is the aphid that attacks the roots of our soul. If the roots are not resistant to doubt, then the productive work of the Holy Spirit will be thwarted. The fruit of the Holy Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, all these good things cannot be produced within us. 
Why is it that you find, we find that fewer and fewer people are attending church? I believe that they doubt that it really is worth it. Somehow the roots in their souls are not resistant to the aphid of doubt, and then it changes their behavior. Eve answered the serpent what Adam had told him. We may eat from the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. Eve knew that the instruction, what the instruction was that God had said and had, did not hesitate a moment to clarify to the serpent what it really was. She even went a step further and stated what the consequences was of eating the tree of knowledge. This is a wonderful practice. When facing doubt to search for truth, we do not always know the reason behind the truth, but it is the truth that will set us free if we are living so that the Holy Spirit is allowed to bear fruit in our lives. The fruit known as joy is certainly a sign that we are filled Remember, free okay. of doubt. Wow. Happiness is our, so, in our roots our and real it will be explained. You cannot no, no. certainly it's die, the serpent yeah, said to Eve, for God knows that when you eat from, your, from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God knowing good and evil. Boy, oh boy, the old serpent is pouring it on now. It is saying, now look at what you are missing out on. You could have the same knowledge as God if only you would eat some of that fruit from that one tree. You would not need to have God tell you what is good and evil because now you would be equal with God. He is saying that it is not fair that you do not have this knowledge. God is holding out on you and this is not the reason you should be, there's not a reason in the world that you would be, should be missing this out. There is, this is where color begins for Eve. It seems up to now she did not have to, she did not pay any attention to that fruit of that tree. It seems that she never thought about the possibility that she was missing out on something that could make her equal with God. She thought maybe the serpent was right that nothing would happen if she did eat the fruit. It didn't seem to make some sense. It did make some sense to her that it would be possible that she would not die if she obtained knowledge of good and evil. She says, look at God. God had had the knowledge and has anything happened to God? No, God is still alive and well, and certainly it wouldn't affect me either. She's beginning to allow the aether to push the wedge of doubt deeper into the roots of her soul. She begins to be unhappy with how she is being treated, not as important as God. This is not right, she is thinking. So she begins to think about the possibilities as she moves towards the tree. And she sees that it's pleasing to the eye and it's desirable for gaining wisdom. So she pulled off a piece of the fruit and ate it. There was not any lightning. The earth didn't shake. She thought this is good. Ah, maybe Adam could enjoy some of this. Here we see she does not want her husband to miss out also. She is preparing for the transmission of the aphid of doubt to Adam. This is the way it works, folks. We share our unhappiness with others and try to get them on the bandwagon of doubt. Most of us do not want to be alone in our unhappiness and we share our frustrations with others until we find someone else that's gonna jump on the bandwagon with us. Self-esteem issues of unhappiness is spread to others and soon the whole group of people could be on the bandwagon. And then maybe we have to get a bigger bandwagon for everybody to get on. To think that this all started with the one little question. Did God really say, you little aphid? Like a good husband, Adam said, was thinking, hmm, happy wife, a happy life. Without a second thought, he ate it also. This is when it happened. 
Both Adam and Eve had a very enlightening moment. They went from one feeling of unhappiness to another feeling of unhappiness. They had the unhappiness of missing out on something that God had, and now they're suddenly unhappy and ashamed that they were naked. Now they had to correct the problem, had to go to work to make a covering for themselves. This had never been done before. They came up with the idea somehow about using fig leaves, and possibly this is the first invention in the world. Clothing from great fig leaves. The feeling of unhappiness was going to get worse. It was, it has a way of taking over more and more of us. They heard the sound of the Lord God as they were walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Now, is that a great way to enjoy the fellowship with God? As this should have been the time of the day when they, God would come and they would sit together, walk together in the cool of the day. On top of the feeling of being ashamed, they now were missing out on the special time that they had at the end of the day. They would walk and talk, and then they would also be accompanied with God, and he would also say to them as they looked over all that they had done, well done, my faithful friends. What an unhappy moment, being afraid. There is not any evidence that they ever felt afraid before. Letting the aphid of doubt grow to coveting something that they were missing had led them to an unhappy moment. What could they have been thinking while huddled together with nervous eyes and prepared with jittery legs, ready to move, get away from God as he would come near? Of course, God called out, where are you? It was Adam who answered. He was honest in the answer the, as the way he gave it. He said to God, uh, we, were we should have been uh, unaware of you and we were afraid because we were naked. God asked him, who told you that you were naked? Because it hadn't been a problem up to now. Adam was a quick thinker. He was not going to tell God that he had feelings that he was being treated unfairly. He wasn't going to, he wasn't going to tell God that he was withholding good and beautiful fruit for eating. He wasn't going to tell God that he had failed to follow the instructions for giving, living in the garden. Instead, Adam said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the garden, from the tree, and I ate it. There you go. I'm not responsible. I'm not the problem. I would not have done it if it wasn't for you, God, had you not forced this person on me. Eve had the same quick thought when she blamed it upon the serpent. This failure to take responsibility for their actions is a natural response of someone who was unhappy in their circumstances. It's natural for someone with lowest self-esteem. Life is unfair, they believe. Life was better before. So what could Adam and Eve have done? They should have admitted that they were wrong and failed God. They should have said they were sorry for what they did. And they should have determined to change their behavior going forward. Many say, I'm sorry, without meaning. We have a saying in our house, just saying sorry doesn't cut it. There has to be a change of behavior. They should have determined why they felt that God was holding out on him, them. This is getting down to the root. This is down to where the core of our being, where the aphid was dwelling. Why did they think? they needed to be equal with God. We don't have any idea what would have happened if they had followed those simple steps. Maybe God would have changed his reaction or his behavior or his response to them. Maybe life could have been made easier for them. Maybe Cain would have learned not to covet Abel's relationship with God, thus Abel, would have been, not been murdered, 
and Cain would have had a happier life. The action of coveting affected why Adam and Eve were created. They now were speak, spending time making clothing and hiding from God. They were to have fellowship with God. They were to be tending the garden. But no, that was not happening, and they were not happy. This morning, how are your roots? Are they healthy roots? Or are they aphids of doubt causing you to have moments of envy, jealousy, and anger? In Psalms 23, we read the words, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. This is not the American way. We are always led to believe that we are missing out on something. We need it, and we need it now. It is what makes the economy work. But God is saying, you can be happy with me. Keep your eyes on me, and I will make you happy. Paul wrote in Hebrews in the 12th chapter, make every effort to live in peace with everyone and be holy. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that, he writes, that no bitter root grow up to cause trouble and defile many. He's saying it wasn't just in you it'll affect, it affects others as well. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Determine this moment to trust God and to rest fully in his arms. Allow your roots to become resistant to the aphid of doubt and covenant. Go down to the roots to deal with the fruit. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are just so thankful that you are interested in our thoughts and in our thinking processes, and you understand how we think. We just pray that as we go forth from here today, that we will be able to think more at times about the little things that attacked our soul and help us to be able to rely on you and shield those thoughts and those actions from our heart and soul. In Jesus' name we pray. God has been good, you have been faithful, and the ushers will take the offer.
Let us join in the prayer of dedication and thanksgiving. Loving God, we give talents and offerings to you. Bless and use them to accomplish your will through this church. We ask that every amount will be invested in the furthering of your work. Grant wisdom to those who will handle the appropriation of these funds so that they may make good, productive, and wise use of the offerings we are giving to you today. Direct our ministry spending towards spreading the gospel and disciplining your children towards spiritual growth and service. And bless the works of our hands. Amen. Are there some happy moments that you want to talk about and share with the Lord? Are there some concerns that you would also like to share? We are, yes. Her husband, Gary, is having biopsies taken this week. Yes. That's progress. Yeah. Nora, decisions on the future for her. Pray for her. Other others. Let us pray. Lord, we come to you evening, knowing that you are with us and you hear us. And we know that you are faithful. You've promised it. We've read promises this morning of that. You'll never leave us nor forsake us. But we do have happy moments. We think of Nora and we just pray that you'll be with the medical team around her. Give comfort to the parents, the grandparents, all in the family. We pray for Carol's husband and as he has tests and we just pray, Lord, that there's good news. We also think of this congregation, this church, this place in Ogden, which is your church. Right now, Lord, there's a lot of wisdom that needs to be given to us. We need direction. We need to have the peace and comfort that you're leading us while we're looking for someone to be the pastor of this church. Lord, that, that causes a lot of uncertainty on us, causes a little frustration. But we just pray that none of us will have that doubt come into our life, that we would cause angst among the church. Help us to be submissive to you and give us the wisdom that we need to be able to direct. We think about our community that we live in and how unhappiness happens in our community and the communities around us and this city that we live near. We just pray in a special way that there'll be healing in the souls of people in this city so that the violence taking of life can cease. We need to have a miracle in that respect, Lord, and give wisdom to people to be able to help that to happen. We thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness to us. And as you have taught us to pray over the years, we pray now. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us of our debts as we give our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's stand together and sing that song. They'll know we are Christians because we don't doubt, we don't have the ape, it's because we have love. Time of the Seder, as we mentioned once before, there are four cups of the Passover. The first is I bring out you out of the land. I give you a new mission. The second cup in the Seder is I will deliver you. I will give you freedom. I will. And the th third is I will redeem you. There's forgiveness. The fourth is I will accept you. In other words, I will go with you. I will be your God and sustain you. May the Lord bless you today and this week.